zip code? 90046. Social security number? 524223588. Telephone? 876-0930. Why Man Creates is a short film that appeared in 1968, 50 years ago. The little vignette that introduces this video comes from it. It shows how life, or its representation in society at least, has become numbers, data. Our exchanges in society, numerical. Fifty years ago, human relationships with technology were already complicated. And in 1968, people were asking some of the same questions we're going to unpack and explore this semester. The questions persist and perhaps they're never completely solved. It's telling that technology figured into a movie about why man creates. Human creativity and ingenuity and technology are profoundly linked. We're bound together by technology. It provides us with a creative outlet. It often relieves us from labor. It amuses us. And yet, most of us also feel its pressure and its threat. Technology is ambiguous. The course we're beginning approaches technology in thematic units. We'll look at relationships and perhaps redefinitions that technology has with art and creativity. How does technology frame creative work? How might technology reveal what creativity is? We'll explore surveillance and how technology is changing the powers of watching, broadly speaking, and the ideas that we have about privacy and consent to be surveilled. We'll look at how facial recognition technologies, for example, figure into social life and the controls that are present in society. We'll consider the problem of misinformation, which is likely to be a big uh, issue in this year of politics in 2020. Uh, but it also touches many parts of our lives, including medical care and health. And we'll consider the notion of transparency. How can technology shed light on injustice, for example? How can transparency serve as a remedy and a tool to reveal technology's impacts to us? We'll explore different ways of looking at technology, but I want to start out by looking at uh, technology platforms. That is, uh, technologies that form the basis for elaboration and innovation that extends the original technology. Sometimes it's good just to look at one that um, is so familiar already that it doesn't feel like a technology at all. Uh, it's just part of life, uh, something like printing. Everyone knows the story of the invention of movable type. Uh, it was uh, the technology that set a printing revolution into motion, and printing technologies uh, created the printed book, one of the type of printed products that we're very familiar with. And the printed book, one could say, created a platform for other print-related technologies that were not necessarily um, new even when they finally appeared in print. But these have become the standard apps of the technology of printing and books. Let me point out three of them, all related to religious text, which after all were um, popular on the presses in the 15th and 16th centuries. First, the Talmud. Edward Mendelssohn wrote that medieval manuscripts of the Bible were the first books to be interconnected by a system of cross-references marginal notes that directed a reader from one biblical passage to another, perhaps to a passage written at a distance of hundreds of years from the first. He was interested in comparing and in particular contrasting um, the Talmud with its links, with modern hyperlinks that we see on the web. Such linking is quite sophisticated in the Talmud, uh, which has a heritage going back into antiquity, 
Thousands of rabbis contributed over time to the Talmud, and the work is considered a cornerstone of rabbinical thought and wisdom. The edition of the Talmud that was completed by Daniel Bomberg in Venice between 1520 and 1523 set the pagination of most subsequent printings of the Talmud. A glance at a page shows the scheme. Commentary and texts are interspersed on the page, making related texts immediately present and linked in view. And these are strategically arranged to help scholars evaluate the commentary. Second, verse numbers and annotation shorthand. An innovation, uh, this is the printing app, so to speak, are chapter and verse numbers. These had been used before, but the Greek New Testament that Robert Stephanos issued in 1551 standardized a verse numbering system that still is used in modern Bibles. Uh, as many technologies end up doing, this one has shifted into the background for many Christians and uh, become part of the landscape of reading. The verse numbers themselves stand for the text and address of sorts. And it's not unusual to see biblical references on bumper stickers simply indicated by a verse citation. And then there's the footnote. The footnote form was especially used in early English translations of the Bible, notably the, the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible, where interpretations, sometimes conflicting, actually often conflicting, and glosses of texts were inserted and references to other works could be linked to the text. The footnote has developed into what Princeton historian Anthony Grafton has called one form of proof normally supplied by historians in support of their assertions. A footnote roots truth by linking statements to origins and authorities. These are features that we now take for granted in books. And in the case of the footnote, they've been refined further to fit the purposes of whole scholarly communities. In the 16th century, they also had their precedence, but printing technology provided a set of tools that allowed for standardization. These methods of annotation became, in a sense, standard apps of the printed codex. The innovations in printing technology in early modern Europe reverberated in politics and culture, too. Uh, the extensive powers of platform technologies put pressure on large structures of human society. The accommodation and adjustments that societies made when transformative technologies like printing arise uh, that are often quite disruptive. In the case of printing technology, some of the transformations that occurred were the quick dissemination of ideas to a much broader public. An increase in literacy, a challenge to learned authorities. Some scholars link the Protestant Reformation to the advent of printing and the social transformations that printing brought about. And so over the course of decades and maybe even centuries, parts of human society that were touched by printing came under controls and governance. Some of the controls had consequences that were pretty rough. The Edict of Chateaubriand of June 27th, 1551, which Robert Stephanus probably knew about, includes this passage in Article 8. It is forbidden to all printers to perform the exercise and status of impression except in good cities and orderly establishments accustomed to do this, not in secret places. And it must be under a master printer whose name, domicile, and mark are put into the books thus printed. He will answer to faults and errors that either by him or under his name and by his order will have been made and committed. Such regulations attempted to control printing and control the communications that they en enabled in the time. So what happened um, to the printer who didn't follow the rules? Antoine Augereau, 
was strangled and burnt on December 24th, 1534, for having printed and sold books of Luther. Ten years later, Etienne Dolay, a humanist who had become a printer, was strangled and burned along with his censured books. From such turmoil and regulation, the systems of control, licensing, copyright, made peace between printing technology and society. Social and cultural innovation met technological innovation. That kind of back and forth of technology and regulation continues, and it's probably particularly pressing today. But would that have been a red flag inside the company that something that's patently false was being propagated to millions of people on the platform? I think if you ask the question that way, it would have been. But I think when you ask then the next question, which is the harder and the more important question, was, which is, so what do you do about it? You then very quickly get into issues of not only free speech, but to what degree is it anybody's responsibility as a technology platform or as a distributor to start to decide when you've gone over the line between something that is clearly false um, from something that may or may not be perceived by everybody to be clearly false and potentially can do damage. A little about the readings and videos for the course. I began thinking about this course as I was pulling together research on a book project on art and the automobile. Uh, and I found that the story of the integration of the car in American society and culture was fascinating and well worth telling. And it seemed to me that the story was one example of how a culture accommodates and absorbs and, in fact, is completely transformed by an invention by a new technology. The car as a tool and a technology opened up new opportunities for people, and it changed people as well. The car has remade us into drivers, and the car has become almost a natural part of the human environment. That's a technology adoption story. The resources for the course explore the processes and the consequences of different and newer technologies, ones that are more relevant today and that are beginning to go through that process of adaption and adoption, um, and that process of transforming us. Uh, as a result of that, that focus, the readings are a bit more current events type, current um, analysis, um, much more provisional and, and, and on the edge of events rather than reflecting upon events. So you'll find that I've chosen magazine articles, um, articles that have appeared in, in websites, uh, video presentations, video shows on television. Um, and I've collected over the past year or so um, several hundreds of these, these items, and I've chosen from them. It's important to keep up with the readings. Um, that is, I expect you to have read or watched the videos before the discussion of them comes up on the syllabus or before they are um, the central core of the topic in, a, say, a video lecture. Um, I'm less worried about the videos than I am about the readings because I think that the videos are engaging enough that you'll probably uh, binge watch them, or at least there's a high probability that you will. Before we were visited by the coronavirus, I had proposed this course as a seminar that was reliant on thoughtful exchanges of readings and of topics uh, in a classroom. Uh, the course, as I proposed it, was to be a no laptops course, meaning that laptops would close before the class begins and soft, uh, uh, smartphones would be put away as well. Well, so much for that. Uh, we can still discuss and have thoughtful exchanges though it's a little bit more structured and framed within Zoom and perhaps a couple other technologies. It's a bit ironic, um, perhaps, that a course that is critical of our complex relationships with technology should be also so heavily indebted to technology, but maybe there's a lesson there as well. 
We will have uh, breakout discussions and regular discussions using Zoom, and you'll also have uh, opportunities to share your thinking in other ways, mainly three products. A short presentation that should be no longer than 10 minutes that presents um, your views or a topic that relates to the overall themes of the course. Um, you have 10 minutes then, uh, you'll be able to get uh, some, some feedback from your peers. Those will begin in September so that we can get through uh, the presentations for the course uh, pretty quickly. That presentation will lead to the final product um, of the course, which is a, a paper with references and a regular scholarly apparatus uh, of footnotes and such. That's due near the end of the semester. And uh, it should present a view of some facet of the topics that we discuss uh, during the course, uh, but do so in a scholarly fashion. And then there is the technobiography. Uh, it's a reflective piece, an essay, a blog post, podcast, video, um, that is on the general topic of how a technology intersected or is continuing to influence your own life or the lives of uh, people that are close to you. In it, you identify a technology and you examine your own personal coming to terms with it or how your families or relatives have done so. How do technologies influence the arc of our own personal histories? How do they exact their costs? How do they open opportunities, change our perspectives? How do we control them or they us? These uh, will be made available on the web through a class website with your permission. The idea comes from a similar product um, that a class did at um, the University of Victoria in British Columbia, uh, where students examined the intersection of automobiles and their own lives or the lives of their families. That project was called Autobiographies, uh, and unfortunately we don't have as handy um, a play on words with technobiographies. In order to help us see how relationships with technology fit into the real life work and study, I've invited several guests to meet with us. They come from fields like medicine, computer programming, computer security, machine learning, the arts, and politics even. They have stories and experiences that relate to the major themes of the course. Your responsibility is to make their time with you worth their time. Uh, you do that by being prepared and by drafting at least two questions that you're interested in hearing them respond to. Those questions will be due uh, the class session before the guest arrives, and uh, they will be shared with the guest beforehand so that he or she can come to class with some level of expectation and understanding about what people are interested in. The idea is to move the discussion quickly to areas of interest um, and we'll be able to get responses from uh, or maybe even provoke the guest a bit. The guests are given an opportunity to provide you with readings to prepare you for the visits too. So uh, I can expect that there will be ample room for dialogue. The exchanges should be mutually beneficial, uh, both to you, of course, um, but also to the guest, because the guests actually have expressed interest in hearing what Duke students have to say.